Hi, and welcome. Thank you for joining us in this Navigating California Workers' Compensation, Your Rights and Benefits webinar. My name is Carmen, your host, and joining me today is Managing Attorney Bilal Qasim from Pacific Workers, the Lawyers for Injured Workers. Bilal, welcome. Would you like to give us a little details and background of what it is and how long you've been doing workers' comp for? Sure. So my name is Bilal Kassam. Like Carmen said, I'm the managing partner at Pacific Workers. We are a law firm dedicated to helping injured individuals throughout California. And I've been practicing law since 2011. I went to law school in San Diego and slowly made my way back up the coast. And I started this particular practice in 2014. Before that, I was representing, unfortunately, insurance companies and employers in both civil and workers' compensation cases. Now, that's a really great thing to say, unfortunately, but fortunately, because you kind of get to get the best of both worlds representing and knowing what the law is like for employers as it is for the actual injured worker employees. So it kind of gives you a really good benefit to both sides of the world. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah, you get to see everything. You know, uh, I represent a lot of employers, a lot of insurance companies. I got to see how they operate. Now, you know, I get to take my skills and experience and help the people that need it most. Interesting. So if you were able to join us and read the agenda, there's a lot we're going to be diving into today in regarding to the California workers' compensation system. Some of those things include understanding what the workers' compensation system is, how do you report an injury, the importance of medical treatment, rehabilitation, temporary disability, permanent disability, your rights, and your vocational rehabilitation. There's a lot of people that don't even know about that one. What does it look like returning to work? So there is a lot of information we're going to be diving into for this webinar. But I'd like to focus right now on the importance of the California workers' compensation system. I think there's a lot of people who don't understand how important it is to know and understand the system itself. It's not a, a one-piece cookie cutter that you're just going to be able to just get it right off the bat. Think of this as you trying to select your medical benefits at work and it's so many different options that if you really don't know what you're doing, you might put a, a rope around your neck and screw yourself over for that entire year. What is this importance for in understanding the workers' compensation system for an injured worker? Well, I think we can start with explaining what workers' compensation is. Perfect. So workers' compensation is a system isn't that old. Um, the courts have been around uh, a very long time. You know, back in the day, you used to be able to sue everyone for something called negligence, meaning like if someone breached a duty of care to you, whether it's your employer, your best friend, your parents, a landlord, a business acquaintance, and that breach of duty caused the injury to you, you'd sue them in civil court. And you would get damages, things like lost wages, pain and suffering, all that stuff. The problem with negligence as a theory of law is that you have to prove fault. Mm -hmm. I can't simply say that you did something and that in and of itself caused me injury and therefore I deserve to receive payment from you. So inherently there's a problem with that when people get injured at work because people are engaging in activities that aren't voluntary. They're not doing it for fun, right? right. You know, people aren't just going spending 80% of their human existence trying to earn a paycheck just because they want to. That's not how yeah. it goes, you know. So people are making sacrifices for the benefit of their employer. And sometimes that means giving up their mental and physical well-being. And so to the extent people have those injuries, why should they have to prove fault? Right. Why, why should they have to prove something? Why should they have to establish that their employer did something so wrong, so bad that they deserve to be compensated when they shouldn't have been hurt in the first place because the only reason they got hurt is because they're working for their employer. Because that business existed. How dare you have a business that <laughs> injured me? How dare you decide to have a business that hired me? <laughs> well, so that's where the legislature came in. The legislature said, you know what? Negotiating, you know, with unions and such, like maybe we should have this system where injured workers don't have to prove fault. They don't have to prove that the employer did something wrong. They, just by virtue of the fact that they're an employee, and they were injured, they deserve compensation. And so this event was called the Grand Bargain. It was way back when. And basically, that created workers' compensation as a system in California. And so in exchange for giving up the right to sue their employers, the benefits delivery system, known as workers' compensation, was created to cover things like medical care and benefits. Interesting. So it makes sense. It's a benefit that is going to benefit all. 
whether that's the employer taking care of the fact that they're not going to get sued, they're not going to go bankrupt, and taking care of the employee, someone who's been injured, and it's not looking for someone who's at fault. Like, whose fault was it? It's just a simple accident that happened at work, and there is a system in place. However, it might not be the best system for some of the people, <laughs> but in essence, it's kind of helping both parties out and just having a ballpark idea of what to do when things like that happen. Now, of course, it happens all the time. There's a lot of people that don't believe they're going to get injured. And next thing you know, accidents happen. That's why they're called accidents. What do you expect or what are the types of, I guess you can say, coverages and what entitles you to being able to get workers' compensation? So first, I think it's important to to understand and, and abbreviate what coverage comes with workers' comp. Without getting into too much detail, just right off the back, I don't want to overwhelm anyone. You know, it's basically financial benefits and medical benefits. That's a, the large two buckets of ways to establish things. It's things like temporary disability that cover lost wages, permanent disability that's designed to compensate you for functional limitations after you've healed as much as you can from your injury, as well as covered medical care, meaning that the workers' compensation, excuse me, the workers' compensation insurance company should be covering your medical needs, not, you know, your own insurance or paying out of pocket. Makes sense. So it's a simple cookie cutter, right? You get injured at work while you're getting better from this injury, you're entitled to um, medical treatment. So anything that has to do with those injuries or that illness you've received it should get covered by the workers comp insurance and it should not come from your pocket. Number two would be any, um, let's say if you're staying at home, not working, it's supposed to help you temporarily stay on your feet without necessarily being able to work or partially being able to work. It's supposed to pick up the pieces financially for you. And then you're telling me um, permanent disability, anything that happens to you that you're no longer considered 100% and able to do the things you were supposed to, it's supposed to pick up the pieces for that permanent disability as well after the fact. So looks like a pretty easy system. Pretty, you know, it's supposed to be straightforward. and, and Really, as you've noticed, I didn't talk about things like pain and suffering or punitive damages. Those are damages that are designed to punish the person you're suing. Those things aren't included in workers' compensation. I think that goes back to why workers' comp was created in the first place. It was to strike a bargain between what is the employer's liability and what is the injured worker entitled to, and how do we balance those two interests in a way that makes it a sustainable area of law for both sides. And so, Interesting. you know, injured workers potential damages were limited as opposed to being able to sue in civil court. But, right. you know, they gave that up for things like immediate medical care or lost wages while you're recovering. You know, right. Those aren't things you get when you sue someone in civil court. No one's paying you a check while your case is going on. So. No, 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 no. Those are things you have to pay out of pocket. So in how much the law has changed in coming up with this new system of the California workers' compensation system, would you say that was a good bargain? Like, not being able to sue someone. Maybe. <laughs> in theory, right? Like the whole idea behind it being a quick and efficient system designed to compensate workers, getting them on their feet, getting them the care they need sooner and later. Like that's a beautiful thing. But in practice, because insurance has been involved in it, it's more so moved from let's take care of injured workers to how do we limit costs? Meaning how do we as an insurance company take in more in insurance premiums and we pay out in claims in order to maximize our profitability? And so Inherently, it's become a, a, a litigious system where there's a lot of push and pull and, and fighting over little things. Right. Tell me a little bit about what the eligibility looks like for someone who, who's injured at work. How are you eligible to get the California workers' compensation system pay for some of this stuff? So if you're an employee in California and you were injured on the job, you're good. <laughs> defined an employee because there's so yeah. many types of employees there's contractors there is part-time employees none of that stuff employees. matters none of that stuff matters so it doesn't matter if you were injured on the first hour of your first day at work if you were an employee and you were injured on the job you get benefits of course there are exceptions to that meaning you know the, and we can go into those later about you know if you're voluntarily fighting or you were on drugs and that caused your injury. Of course, that stuff doesn't count. Those are exceptions to the rule. But generally speaking, the rule is if you're an employee and you're injured, that's it. 
you, you get the benefits. Doesn't matter how long or little you were there, whether or not you were seasonal, part time, or on contract. Tell me about those that are immigrants here in the United States. Does that apply to them as well? So, yeah, this comes up uh, a lot, both in wage and hour law, employment law, as well as workers' comp law. If you are working in California, you are entitled to the same rights as anyone else. It doesn't matter whether you're here legally, illegally, whether you have a green card, whether you're a citizen, it does not matter. If you are employed here, even if it's under the table in cash because you're legally not allowed to work, you still get workers' comp benefits and you still get the same protections for employment law, meaning your boss can't abuse you. They can't underpay you under minimum wage. They can't deny you overtime. They can't deny you meal and rest periods. They can't treat you any differently than they would any other person in California. That's great. Great to hear. I'm excited to know that you don't have to accrue some type of hours before you're even entitled to this benefit as you would for vacation time or personal time off or even sick days, right? You have to have been working for X amount of period before you're even entitled to that. So you just said it, working the first hour of of your job and you just so happen to get injured, know that you're going to get covered. So that's that's a very important thing to know. Talk about the exclusive remedy principle. Just define what that is and why is it in the California workers' comp system? So the exclusive remedy rule refers to the fact that if you are injured at work, you have no other recovery. You cannot sue your employer. And that was part of the trade-off way back in the grand bargain was to say, hey, how do we limit exposure for employers? If we are going to give the injured workers these benefits, these immediate benefits, this free medical care, this free temporary disability and permanent disability, what do we as employers get? And it was designed in a way that said, okay, well, employers, if you give the injured workers this stuff, you guys are protected from tort liability, meaning the the employee cannot sue you in civil court for negligence or other issues. And that's important because we also don't want to leave all of these employers bankrupt or just in general in court all the time, because then why would anyone even want to have a business? So it it makes sense. Let's dive into our next important subject in the workers' compensation system here in California, and that's reporting an injury. What is the importance behind reporting an injury? How does someone do it? How do you notify them that you've been injured? What does that look like? So the first step to reporting an injury is filling out what's called a DWC-1 claim form. This is a state form that's used to report all work injuries. You can Google it or, you know, we can drop a link to a copy of it so you guys can check it out. But really, it's just a form that you fill out and your employer fills out and that gets sent to the insurance company. And that basically starts the, the formal process of reporting your case. And sometimes it's not so easy to get your hands on one of these forms because maybe you have a really shady employer or maybe you're in a position where your injury is so catastrophic that you're not conscious or able to actually fill out the form. Or maybe your business is just not so organized where it's like your boss probably doesn't even know what a DWC one, which happens, small mops and pops places. Yeah, there's some businesses, maybe they have two employees, they've never had a work comp case before and they don't know what to do. They know they pay work comp insurance, but they're not sure what to do beyond that. So yeah, it's important you fill out the form if you can. If you can't, you know, at least reporting the claim to your supervisor. Um, If you are going to report to claim and not fill out the form because you can't or it's not available, make sure you report it in writing, you know. Text message will work. Text message will work. uh, Emails work. Right. Even if you you didn't put it in writing, but you documented who you spoke to, when you spoke to them, like what number you called, those types of things, the more evidence you have to substantiate that you reported your work injury, the better off you'll be. And the reason why you report the work injury to the employer is because they provide that then to their insurance company. They're legally obligated to do that. So once the claim gets reported to the insurance company, that really starts the process. Interesting. What happens when you can't get your hands on it? What is the employer's responsibility to kind of come in? And let's say your injury took you straight into the hospital or you were knocked out unconscious. What is the responsibility of your employer? So the employer is not forgiven for just, you know, taking the ostrich approach and sticking their head in the sand and hoping that, you know, if you didn't tell them and you didn't fill out a claim form that they can just, you know, walk away from it with, uh, with no issues, right? They have an obligation if they knew or should have known of the work injury from any source, which means if you're working with a colleague and the colleague watches you fall off a roof, you break your neck, you get carted off to the hospital and your colleague calls your supervisor and says, hey, tell the home office that, you know, Bob fell off the roof, he's gone to the hospital. That's good enough to start the process. The employer then has to report that claim to the insurance company, even if 
you did not directly report it. So they have a duty to actually exercise good judgment. And if right. they have reason to know about the injury, they need to report it to the insurance company. Okay. Uh, perfect scenario. It's life. What happens if they don't? Well, they can be held accountable for insurance fraud, for one. They can be held accountable for what's called a 132A claim, which is discrimination based on having been injured at work and trying to report it. If, for example, they're told by a colleague that um, you were injured and then they're like, ah, oh, whatever, forget it. They just disregard it. That could be a form of discrimination or retaliation against you. But they can be held legally accountable for that, whether it's penalties, sanctions, insurance fraud, a bunch of other stuff. Does this also include when the employer tries to bribe an employee and says, hey, just say this happened at work at home. It didn't happen <laughs> at work. Does that fall into play as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, again, it's probably a form of insurance fraud. Um, and, you know, companies, if they're licensed contractors, can lose their license. They can get in serious trouble for it. But one of the important components to think about, too, is if the if the employer is that kind of employer where they're going to lie about it because when people get hurt at work, the employer's insurance can go up. It's like car accidents. The more accidents you're in, the higher your premium. Same thing for workers' comp insurance. And so employers sometimes don't like workers' comp cases because they look at it as like a personal attack where they say, oh, well, you're causing me to pay more money and you're causing problems, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes employers do try to coax employees into saying that their injury did not happen at the job site because maybe they have a close relationship and they say, oh, well, right. you know, you don't want to hurt my business. This is you my brother-in-law. Like, yeah. I can't do that to my brother-in-law. Yeah, That's or or even, you know, you've worked together for a long time and the employer's guilt tripping you. says, oh, well, you know, you care about us. You care about our relationship. We, we've been good to you. You want to be good to us, right? Right. You know, if you go to the doctor and say this happened at work that, you know, it'll cause increased costs and I don't know if I can afford that and blah, blah, blah. And then the employee's like, you know, sure, boss. Like, I care about you. I care about this business. I'm loyal. I've been here. You know, I will say, you know, I'll go tell my doctor I hurt my back when my friend was moving a couch or something. Mm -hmm. Then that gets put into the medical records that you got hurt helping your friend move a couch. And then when you come try and file the claim later because you need back surgery, your employer's like, I don't know what happened. He didn't get hurt at work. He said he's helping his friend move a couch. Mm -hmm. So never listen to your employer. Make sure you always report it in writing again, if possible, because okay. that can be a big problem later. How often do you see this scenario play out? All the time. I've got a, I'm in the middle of a trial right now where the same exact issue is happening. Interesting. That's good to know. Yep. Uh, in a nutshell, just write it, have it in writing, report the injury. Don't try to undermine what happened at work or where it happened. That's kind of like your receipt to starting your workers' compensation claim here in California. Yeah, and I think it's important to specify when you're talking about imputing knowledge to the employer, Make sure you're reporting it to someone in a supervisory capacity, like an agent of the employer that's responsible for overseeing you or other people at the company, someone that's above you. It always helps to have witnesses to your other colleagues and such, but really you want to go straight as much as you can straight to the source when you're reporting the case. Next, we're going to dive into the medical treatment and the rehabilitation. What are your rights to medical treatment? Talk a little bit about what that looks like. So in workers' compensation, medical treatment is a little bit different than what going to your own private doctor through insurance is like. So when you get hurt and you have insurance, you go to your doctor. Your doctor says, hey, I want to give you medical care. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, go down to the second floor of the Kaiser building, get an MRI, then go to the first floor and stop at the pharmacy on your way out. And it's like you got everything you needed that day. Mm -hmm. In workers' comp, there's a system. Well, there's a couple of different systems. There's one, it's called the medical treatment utilization schedule, which is basically a guide that tells you how to treat injured workers or patients in workers' comp, meaning you do certain things in a certain way, kind of check the boxes along the way. And there's something called utilization review, which is probably the worst thing to ever exist in workers' comp. And really, utilization review is a system in which the insurance company has medical professionals reviewing your doctor's requests for authorization and saying yes or no. So let's say you go to your doctor and your doctor says, I want to do an MRI. You're like, great. I would love an MRI. I think it'd help figure out what's going on with me. And your doctor says, great. I'll request authorization for it. Your doctor submits a request for authorization and then utilization review for the insurance company gets to say, no, that's not happening or yes, it is. Okay. And so 
your doctor can say they want to do all this different stuff. I want to give you pain medication, epidural injections, MRI, send you off for chiropractic, and the insurance company can say, nope, 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 nope. Yikes. Yep. It's a really awful system. So because of that, a lot of injured workers are deprived of the medical care they actually need. Um, There is an appeals process for utilization review denials, and that's called independent medical review. And that's essentially appealing to the state uh, to take a second look to say, hey, the insurance company abusing, you know, their power here, or did this doctor not necessarily review the right material or understand the request in the right way? And should the denial be overturned? Right. And right now, the overturn rate's pretty low. Um, about 90% of utilization review denials are upheld on appeal. Nice. No, I mean, not nice. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> terrible. Terrible, terrible. Nice yeah. to know that it's not going to work in your benefit. Yes. Yeah. Is, is essentially... That, that sucks. So this is, again, obtaining some sort of authorization for medical treatment. It looks like it's a nightmare mm-hmm. in the sense of they're not making it easy for you. No, you don't just go and get treatment like you would with your doctor. Right. I think that's the biggest takeaway. So, you know, when you go to your doctor's appointments, I mean, there's setting the expectation that you may have these great conversations with your doctor about the things that they want to do for you but those things may not actually happen Happen if they don't get approved. So what does it look like choosing a treating physician? How do you even go about that? Like I would hate to have a doctor that just is careless. So there's things in workers' compensation called medical provider networks. Most insurance carriers and employers have them nowadays. Basically, this is a network of doctors that are pre-authorized to see you. They still require authorization, but they're on like the good list, right? Where Mm -hmm. you're allowed to go see them. The rule in workers' compensation essentially is that if there is a valid medical provider network and you don't have a pre-designated physician or something like that, that you need to go to an in-network doctor. It means you can't go to your your primary care doctor that you see, you know, in your own private insurance. Right. It's you're limited, so you have to select a doctor from the network. Sometimes there's a lot of choices. Sometimes there's not many. Right. So what's essentially the role of this MPM list? Why do they have this? rule set in place that you could only choose those specific doctors? How does that play in? So there's a lot of rules in workers comp, especially for doctors, as well as lawyers, as well as injured workers and insurance companies. And the rules basically govern how doctors operate. And within the medical provider network, there's doctors that agree to do things in a certain way, right? You have to write reports in a certain way. You have to bill in a certain way. You can't just do whatever you want, whenever you want. So you have to be part of the medical provider network actually see the first patient or see the patient in the first place, then you still have to play by the rules and do things the right way after. So, you know, you wind up in a situation where in some respects, I guess it can be helpful because it streamlines the process a little bit, but others, it's rather bad because it limits who you can see and when you can see them. What are some of the tips you can give someone that's going through the system now in regards to choosing an MPN? Is there some sort of trick or some sort of something that they can look at from this NPM list. First of all, does the injured worker even get to see this NPM list? Is the doctor just assigned to you automatically? Like, how does this fall into place? So when you're first injured at work, uh, insurance companies have medical control. You go to the first appointment with the industrial clinic. Usually it's not a great clinic. Usually it's one that's, you know, designed to get you back to work as soon as possible and not give you the most medical care or benefits. And once you see that doctor, you're entitled to choose a new doctor afterwards. And so the insurance company, upon request, can provide you with a link to the medical provider network. Right. And usually it's online. Um, You simply log in and you go to the website and you type in um, a specialty or geographic radius. And then you basically pick a doctor from the list. And then you designate that doctor as your primary treating physician. And primary treating physician refers to, think of it like the quarterback of your workers' comp case. They're like the main hub for all things medical. If you need, um, let's say you're seeing an occupational medicine doctor, but you need a spine surgery. The occupational medicine doctor may still be your primary treating physician, but they may request that you see a spine surgery consult, or they may say, you know what, you have depression, stress, and anxiety. You need to go see a psychologist or psychiatrist as well. Gotcha. And so they stay on the case as kind of like the hub of everything. And you keep going back to see them. But as you're seeing them, maybe you branch off and see other doctors mm-hmm. as well. Interesting. Um, it's a lot, a lot of information to dive into. Um, and again, you're going to be able to find all of the main points that we're going to be talking about in this webinar throughout 
the rest of the descriptions and stuff. So make sure you guys visit every link we share so that way you get an in-depth conversation or information in regards to some of this stuff. Let's jump into medical treatment and rehabilitation. What is your right to medical treatment? I heard in previous conversations you were having, there's a lot of authorizations happening. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens without authorization. So essentially, what is your right to medical treatment? It's whatever utilization review blesses you with and allows you to have. So, you know, generally speaking, if you have a workers' comp case, you're entitled to all medical treatment that's reasonably necessary to cure or alleviate, you know, your symptoms. And that, of course, is subject to utilization review, which means as much as doctors may feel you have a need for certain medical care, you may not necessarily actually be entitled to it. <laughs> but your need for medical care, in theory, could never go away. In which case, you could have a situation where you're entitled to medical care for the rest of your life. What does this look like for someone that has been injured at work? They are now treating for temporary uh, medical treatment or temporary benefits. Let's dive into what this temporary looks like. What is temporary disability? So temporary disability is a form of benefit that's designed to compensate you for lost wages while you're recovering from your injury. The idea is that you're off of work, you can't earn a paycheck, you should be getting these benefits to kind of help you get by. And it's generally calculated by multiplying your average weekly wage, like two thirds of your average weekly wage is the calculation, up to minimums and maximums in California. So. If you make less than a certain amount, you get a bare minimum. If you make more than a certain amount, you don't get any more. There's the max. Yikes. So, yeah, you could be someone who's in a high paid position, but your temporary disability may not necessarily be two thirds of your average weekly wage because it doesn't, it's too high. <laughs> right. Which happens. Um, but temporary disability can be paid generally up to two years, um, up to five years from your date of injury. So, the payments could be a total of two years within that five-year period, mm -hmm. and it can be broken up. You could get it for six months, go back to work, then go off again, get it another six months, and then another year, all within like three years, and you're good. If you start your temporary disability at year four, following your date of injury, you don't get two years because it capped out at five. Yikes. So it doesn't matter if you didn't use it or not. You'll just get the remaining of if it was one year, we started at the four. Yep. You just get that one. And there are exceptions to that. Um, I believe HIV, high velocity eye injuries, amputations, um, those are all injuries generally considered catastrophic. And so the temporary disability extends to 240 weeks Interesting. instead of 104. What is the eligibility criteria to get temporary disability? So there's two forms of temporary disability. There's temporary partial disability, which means that you're not bedridden, right? You can still do something. It's just the doctor gave you work restrictions. And because of those work restrictions, the employer can't have you working at all and, or may have you working in a limited capacity. And so you're temporarily partially disabled. And so maybe your temporary disability rate is only the difference between working 40 hours versus 20. Or maybe you just can't work at all. You're temporarily partially disabled at one job. Maybe you have a second job that you can still work at, right? So you may be temporarily partially disabled and entitled to the TPD because of the wage difference. You can also be temporarily totally disabled, which means like, you know, you're not working. It's, yeah. That's it. You're just, you get two thirds of your average weekly wage and that's that. Are there any time limits? Um, you mentioned maximum benefits, but are there any time limits um, assigned to this temporary disability besides the, you know, the cap to weeks that you can get it in the three years? Are there any other times, uh, for example, if someone didn't report their injury on time, what does that look like? So there are statute limitations that apply to workers' comp cases. Um, you know, those are separate issues, but generally speaking for temporary disability, the other kind of time limitation is once you've reached maximum medical improvement. And that means that the doctor feels as though your condition has medically plateaued so that it doesn't matter what they want to do. If they want to do surgery, if they want to do, um, injections, you just don't get any more benefits, uh, temporary disability benefits because you've plateaued and at which point your benefits transition to permanent disability benefits. Speaking about permanent disability benefits, which is our next topic that we're going to be diving into, um, 
explain a little bit and let's try to help um, injured workers understand a little bit about the permanent disability benefits. What does that look like? And how do you even know you're about to get MMI? How do you get ready for it? There's just so much to dive into. Okay. So permanent disability benefits are different than temporary disability benefits. Temporary disability benefits, like I said, were designed to compensate you for lost wages. So for example, every single year, the maximum temporary disability rate gets adjusted by cost of living. So inflation. So mm. every single year, temporary disability has gone up. Permanent disability is not designed to compensate you for lost wages. It's designed to compensate you for the functional limitations that you have from an injury. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not you're making $1,000 a week, $3,000 a week, whatever, you get paid the same permanent disability rate as long as within the minimum and maximum, which is much, much, much lower. Maximum permanent disability rate right now in California is $290. That has not changed since 2013. So yeah, it's terrible. Please write your state assembly member, you know, go do what you can because it needs to change because quite frankly, it's clearly inadequate. I think cost of living, everything's gone up since 2013. So it's pretty clear that that needs to change. But yeah, the max is 290 per week versus the max temporary disability benefit right now, I think is around 1500 per week. So dramatic difference between the two benefits. Let's talk about the impairment ratings. How are these calculated? How does someone, for example, who got injured and healed as much as they could, however, there's just not 100% healing there. How does this rating come into play? So you go see a doctor, um, it can be your treating physician, or it can be a doctor called a qualified medical evaluator. And basically, they take your limited function, and they give it a percentage of impairment relative to your whole person impairment. So meaning, if your perfect functioning body is 100%, right, you may have uh, a leg amputation. And so maybe you have a 40% rating or, you know, you had a total knee replacement as like a 20% rating if you have a good outcome. Or maybe you have issues with range of motion in your arm and shoulder or you have uh, a herniation in your, in your cervical spine. Those are all things that the doctor would give percentage impairment for. That gets adjusted based on your age, your occupation, and generally speaking, what's called a, a diminished future earning capacity. And the whole idea is that running through this formula, you take a percentage and give it an adjustment up or down based on who that person is, what their job was, how old they are and stuff like that. The whole idea being, you know, someone with a, a physical injury, like let's say you're a firefighter and you get your leg chopped off. You're probably not going back to work, especially if maybe you're 50 years old. That's maybe it for you. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to go jump in go back to college and, you know, start over and, you know, redo computer life. science or yeah. something. Yeah, it's just not as, not to say it doesn't happen, you know, but it's, it's certainly less likely than, you know, if I'm 20 years old and I'm a computer scientist and I get my leg chopped off, it doesn't really matter. You know, if I, I can still engineer, I'm still a programmer, I can still type, my mind's in the right place, if hopefully I can still do that job. So it's not as likely that injury would affect me in the same way as it would the firefighter. Right. And so that increases or decreases the value of the case. Is know, that right? discriminating someone for their age within the workers' <laughs> compensation system? Like, hey, you're getting discriminated because you're older, you're going to get more, or because you're younger and you can redo your life. You're gonna... Yeah, I mean, it, it, with certainty, I can tell you the older you are when you have your injury, the higher the value of the case. Right. Because it's less likely that you're going to go back to work. That's really the reason why. Wow. Um, at least supposed to be okay so, but yeah uh, permanent disability it you can't work at the same time you're getting temporary disability you can while receiving permanent disability again because it's not designed to compensate you for your lost wages right let's talk about the permanent disability payment structure what does that look like and what can you tell us about it so just like temporary disability it's paid every two weeks um, most people are max earners, so it's $580 paid every other week until whatever level of permanent disability you have is paid out. So it's a bit of a, a misnomer. People think permanent disability means I'm going to get permanent benefits for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you, yes, depending on how high your rating is, but you can have 
you know, a 20 or 30 or 50 or 60% permanent disability. And it doesn't mean you're getting benefits forever just until that amount is paid out. Yikes. So like, you know, uh, I would have to look at the the tables again, but like, let's say you had a, a 60% rating and that was worth like $120,000. You would get $580 every other week until that $120,000 is paid out. Right. You were mentioning something earlier about the qualified medical evaluators, which is, I'm assuming, another type of doctor that also plays a role in the California workers' compensation system that determines a certain percentage of your body part. And that's the person that essentially ties in the money that you're going to get from your workers' compensation claim. Um, What happens when that person is not your friend, is not being fair, and you need to dispute where do what options do you have there so you go to your primary treating physician for your treatment you go to qme's qualified medical evaluators is an evaluator only their sole job is to look at your medical records they'll do a physical examination for you and ultimately they'll write a report detailing their opinions about your particular case and that includes things like whether or not you had an injury in the first place what body parts are involved, what your work restrictions are, whether or not you are still temporarily disabled or you've reached maximum medical improvement. And if you have reached maximum medical improvement, what your impairment ratings are. And so they have a a, a huge amount of power in your workers' compensation case. And so if you end up with the wrong QME and they write you a bad report, it can really be an uphill battle to try and fix the case. And so yeah, it happens a lot where people go to more conservative QMEs who disagree with treating physician and the insurance company will use that to significantly downplay the value of the case or do things like cut off medical treatment. Yikes. Is this any different from independent medical reviews? Yeah, so independent medical review is just limited to whether or not treatment should be authorized. A QME does not have the ability to overturn a utilization review denial, meaning if your treating doctor wants to do a back surgery and they submit a request for authorization and then the request for authorization is denied by utilization review, then you file an independent medical review application and your appeal is denied, you can't go to the QME to overturn the denial. It is what it is at least for 12 months unless there's a change in circumstance. Great. So the QME can weigh in on medical treatment insofar as whether or not the injury caused the need for the medical care or the, 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 con- the condition for which the medical care is needed was caused by the work injury. And what I mean by that is you can have, let's say, uh, an, a, a blown out knee and you need a total knee replacement. There's a question about whether the medical treatment is appropriate for that condition. So utilization review addresses that they say okay well the doctor wants to do let's say a a left arm amputation but your knee is the injured body part and that's what they're trying to treat utilization review would say whoa like that's no it's not happening right like you're not we're not cutting off your arm to treat your knee yeah silly example but that's what they're really judging. They're looking and saying, is this treatment match up to what's needed to to fix this? That's a good thing. Right. Conceivably. QMEs may weigh in on whether or not, you know, your, your knee was even injured in the first place that necessitates that care. So you may actually have like a blown out knee. Your treating physician could request authorization for a total knee replacement. Utilization review could approve it. Then you could go to a bad QME and the QME could say, no, I don't think the knee was caused by by work. And so it doesn't matter whether or not you need the knee surgery. It's not happening because your knee is not related to your injury. Wow. So you're, you're looking at two different things. And so the QME won't touch the utilization review stuff, but they will weigh on whether or not your injury was caused by work. There's a lot of information that is given in this webinar here. And I've, I hope you're taking all this in. There's just so much to dive into, so many branches that come out of this. We're going to keep moving forward with our next slide. There is another really important 
sector within the California workers' compensation system that a lot of people, for whatever reason, are not familiar with, and that's a vocational rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, Bilal, what this vocational rehabilitation is, and if it's necessary, does everyone get one? Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, vocational rehabilitation is kind of an old term of art, and it really represents the fact that you know, people have functional limitations and that needs compensation, but also people may be forced out of their employment. And so if you have to go back to school, you have to learn something new, like who's going to pay for that, what's covered. And so vocational rehabilitation used to be more robust than it is nowadays. But if you end up having permanent disability and your employer cannot offer you permanent modified work after you've been deemed maximally medically improved within 60 days, then you're entitled to something called a supplemental job displacement voucher. And that's a voucher that's good for up to $6,000 in job retraining. Uh, you can use it within two years of it being served to you. And you can use it for things like uh, laptops or coursework or even you know miscellaneous reimbursement. And the whole idea is that $6,000 is supposed to help you retrain and re-educate yourself. And in addition to that, in California, if you're Injury is after January 1st, 2013, which I mean, pretty much most of the injuries nowadays that we're talking about. Um, right. And you get the voucher, you're entitled to something called the return to work supplement from the state of California. And that's an additional $5,000 payment to you uh, that you can use for whatever you want. It's great to know that you have these services offered if you need to change careers completely because of your injuries or your illness you're not able to jump back into work and things that you would have known easily because that's what your career has been for your entire life these services offered is kind of like giving you a second chance to restarting another career that's going to essentially come into play with whatever necessities you need after your injury a lot of people don't vision not being able to go back to the work they were doing prior because no one ever wants to have a massive injury where it doesn't allow you to go back to the things that you were doing. So knowing that there is services offered and that there is just in general this voucher is very important. Does everyone become eligible for, eligible for this or no? No. So when you've reached maximum medical improvement. Well, let me explain it differently. While you're temporarily disabled, you may have work restrictions, but those work restrictions are gonna change, right? Like you yeah. could have a surgery and get better. You could have some time off to feel better, whatever it is, you know, you're, you're good once you've had that time to like heal up a little bit. Once you've reached maximum medical improvement, then your restrictions move from temporary to permanent, at which time your employer has to engage in what's called the good faith interactive process and determine whether or not you know, they can accommodate your work restrictions to the extent they cannot accommodate your work restrictions. Your employer does not need to keep you on. So a lot of people tend to think this is illegal that they say, oh, well, I had work restrictions. So my employer fired me. Right. Which sometimes it's illegal. Don't don't get me wrong. You know, sometimes the employer doesn't engage in the good faith interactive right. process and it's complete BS. But other times, you know, it's legitimate. Like my my example earlier about losing your leg. If I don't have my legs, I probably can't be a cop. I probably can't be a firefighter. I right. probably can't be a construction worker. There's a lot of limitations on my employment, in which case the employer cannot accommodate me. And it's it, no longer suitable. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's, it sucks, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but they don't have to, you know, basically make up a job or a role for me if it's not something they reasonably could accommodate. So essentially you can be forced out of your work because of work restrictions. And so if the employer doesn't offer you permanent modified work within that 60 days of being maximum medically improved, um, that's when you get the voucher. And so not everyone gets that because some people go back to work. Right. Of course. <laughs> you know, so. Everyone would love to just jump back into where they left off and not need to change careers. So then that's when it makes sense that you wouldn't essentially be getting a, a voucher. Speaking about returning to work, which is our, our next slide for this webinar, what is the importance of returning to work in the sense of your earnings, your job offerings? This is something we, we talked about in this vocational rehabilitation as well, but what does modified work and, and new job opportunities look like when you go back to work? Give us the scenario of some of the things you've seen in the system and injured cases you've taken on. Sure. So I think return to work can mean 
different things to different people. You know, you can have someone who is offered full time permanent work um, that maybe has some restrictions, but it was their usual and customary work. It was what they were doing before, but just maybe some tweaks. You right. Know? Then those other people get offered permanent modified work and it's significantly less pay um, or it's in a different location mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe it's just doing something completely different. And those things are all OK. Right? It's not necessarily discrimination just because they go back to work in a different capacity. Sometimes that's the only way they can go back and maybe right. it's in complete good faith. And so. If they have modified work for you and you choose not to accept it and that modified work is within your work restrictions, technically the employer can say, OK, we're going to go ahead and let you go then. Mm -hmm. um, so the employer only has to actually make a good faith effort. Of course, they can't make up things. They can't single you out and choose you specifically and say, well, you know what? Sally got injured. Sally has the same work restrictions, the, you know, the, the same injury, everything, but we're going to offer her a job that pays 60% less and it's night shift only. But Bob got injured and has the same exact injuries and all that stuff, but we're going to offer Bob the, the day shift and we're going to pay him 100% of what he was earning before. And it's like the same modifications, right? right? That would be some example of uh, discrimination based on their disability and work restrictions and such. But, you know, people may choose not to accept their offer of modified work. They may say, you know what, my doctor says these are my work restrictions, but I really can't do it. Yeah. But it's the doctor's work restrictions that really control. So sometimes people are put in a tough spot where maybe the work restrictions aren't necessarily matching up to what they know they in their feel. heart. They yeah, feel. Yeah, yeah. And they have a tough choice to say, okay, well, if I don't accept this, I could lose my job. If I do accept it, I'm going to put myself at risk for, for further injury. And so in those circumstances, you know, we always tell clients, you know, go try and negotiate with your doctor, ask them to change your work restrictions. You know, if you need it more restrictive, explain why and be upfront with them, you know, and even if they're asking you to do stuff, that's a little, you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's pushing your, your pain threshold a little bit or tolerance, you know, at least go try it, you know, and give then, it a good yeah. effort, you know. Try not to lose your job over it and then go back to your doctor and try and tell them, hey, I went back. I had this bad experience. These are the things that were causing me problems. And I'd really appreciate it if you, you know, made my work restrictions X, Y, and Z. It's good to know that there's rights. And, and what are some of the obligations an injured worker has when returning to work? Do you have to notify? Do you, how does that fall into place? So it depends on whether you're talking about um, returning to work when you've been temporarily disabled or when you've reached maximum medical improvement. When you're talking about uh, being temporarily disabled, you should always be giving your work status to your employer. So you're going to go to your treating physician every 45 days or so, and they're going to give you something called a work status form. And you need to take that work status form and turn it into your employer, and it keeps them up to date on what your work restrictions gotcha. are. So you're always wanting to maintain communication with your employer about what's going on with you. Don't ghost that employer because then they're going to just assume that you're no longer interested and it's just all bad from there. Yeah. And sometimes they can accommodate. Sometimes they can't. You know, I think the vast majority of people want to go back to work. And so they'd be happy if their employer said, you know what, come on back and we'll, we can work with you. We can make sure you're not doing things that will cause injury. Um, but if your employer says, hey, we can accommodate and you don't report back to work, you can actually lose your job. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly important that you maintain contact with the employer, um, especially when it comes time to return to work. Now, you can't dispute the resolution of you returning to work. You mentioned this earlier. If you feel that you're just not there yet, what does this dispute look like? So your treating physician can talk about work restrictions. Your QME can talk about work restrictions, or if you have a lawyer, an agreed medical evaluator. Um, but sometimes the work restrictions aren't the same depending on the doctor. And so, you know, you have to slug it out and determine which doctor you're going to rely on and, you know, which doctor has a better report and stuff. But as far as the work restrictions are concerned, you know, it's something that's brought up a lot. You know, mm -hmm. there's some times where injured workers are given work restrictions that they don't want. They want to be released to full duty. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe the doctor, whether it's the QME or the treating physician, gave them restrictions that were, you know, not enough. And so they want more restrictions, right? And it goes both ways. And I think it's a bit of a dance that you have to do with the doctor to articulate why it is you want what you want. Mm -hmm. 
I will say this, there are a lot of doctors that are sympathetic to people and they don't want them to lose their job. They're not trying to, you know, give them work restrictions. So they're forced out of their employment. And I would say probably more often than not, at least when it comes to reducing work restrictions, so let people go back to work more, I'd say doctors usually accommodate that. They'll nice. usually say, Hey, look, you want to try to go back with the least work restrictions possible? I'll let you try that. Right. Um, and then come back to me if you're having problems and we can, you know, then we can readdress it. Yeah. I think it's harder to go ask for more work restrictions. Yeah, I can see that. It's, it's not going to happen. You were talking earlier a lot and you gave a lot of examples that have to do with firefighters. And it just, there is a, a very important subject within the California workers' compensation system that I think we have not touched yet. Um, and that is getting denied getting your case denied and having that door shut on your face and saying, you're not going to get help. What does that look like for an injured worker? Because it happens. A lot. So I can start by going back to the claims process, right? You know, we talked about earlier how when you're injured, you make sure you report that claim to your employer. You fill out that DWC1 claim form. If you can't get that, just make sure you scream from the rooftop so everyone knows you're injured. Send texts, emails, make phone calls, document, 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 right? Once your claim gets reported to the insurance company, the, the insurance company opens up their case. An adjuster will usually reach out to you. You'll get your first doctor's report. The insurance company has 90 days to investigate your case. And that 90 days is spent determining should we accept liability or should we deny liability? Mm -hmm. So sometimes the insurance company will accept the claim right away. You know, it's clear. Yeah. You sawed your leg off on the job. Of course. 10 people were there watching it. They took you to the hospital. It's like clear as day, you know? Other times, maybe it's not so much. Maybe there was no one that witnessed it. And so. <laughs> Scary. Yeah, maybe they say, well, well we, we don't know that we believe this guy. You know, we talked to him on the phone. We interviewed him. He sounds sketchy, you know. We think we need to do a little more research, talk to the employer and such. If the insurance company does not want to accept it right away, they issue what's called a delay notice. And this is a notice you would get in the mail, just like you would a notice accepting liability for your case. The difference between getting a delay notice and an acceptance notice is that during the delay period, while they're investigating, they do not have to pay you temporary disability benefits. So yeah. if you're off of work because of your injury and work restrictions, they're not going to pay you those benefits during that time. They will provide up to $10,000 in medical treatment, but no temporary disability. So, so you wouldn't be getting paid your check and you would have to use personal time off, sick days as much as you can to kind of pay the bills. People still have bills to pay. Yep. And, you know, tip and trick, if you're in California or an employee, check your pay stubs. There's a line item for something called CASDI, which is California State Disability Insurance. And if your case is on delay or denied, which we'll get to, you can always apply for state disability as a gap stop, assuming you don't have sick time or vacation time accrued. So they'll cover in between. But once the case is accepted, if you're off of work because of work restrictions from the work comp doctor, then they will go back and pay you nice. that retro temporary disability benefit to make up for it and then pay benefits going forward. But mm -hmm. they could go the complete opposite way, which is a denial. Yikes. Okay. And so within that 90 days, if they choose to deny your case, they will cut off your medical treatment. They won't pay you any benefits and you're on your own. What rights do you have if you know you legitimately got injured at work and you do need medical treatment and you're getting cut off? What are your rights? What do you do? Well, you should litigate the case. You know, you'd file a worker's comp case at the Work Comp Appeals Board, which is our court system for worker's comp, and you essentially appeal the denial. Um, and there could be a number of reasons why your case is denied. It could be medically because the doctor said they didn't think you were hurt at work. Could be factually, meaning the insurance company thinks you lied about how your injury took place. You know, maybe they think you actually got hurt snowboarding on the weekend, not, you know, falling off a roof or something. Or, you know, there could be a legal reason, meaning, you know, uh, you were drunk on the job and you were only fell off the roof because you stumbled because you're drunk, right? Or right. you got hurt because you picked a fight with someone bigger than you and they whooped your butt. And, you know, workers' comp doesn't cover right, right, uh, right. initial aggressor injuries. So, you know, there could be a variety of reasons why your case is denied, and you get to appeal that at the Workers' Comp Appeals Board. Interesting. So you have rights. There's options for you to do that. How long does this uh, approval of a denied case take? So <laughs> it can take a long time. You know, it can take a long time, depending on what it is. But 
to file a case at the Work Comp Appeals Board, you need to file it within one year from your date of injury. Or if it was accepted, it's from the last date of the last benefit conferred. But if you're talking about strictly a denial, you get one year. Okay. So that's good to know. There's important dates that you need to take into consideration if your case has been denied. And you need to appeal. That's the only way to kind of reverse that. Is there anything else that we need to talk about as far as like denials? Yeah, when you're talking about denials, um, you know, it can be as easy as having to go against a doctor because it was just their opinion. They didn't think you were hurt at work, but it's easy to find a doctor that has a different opinion. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about a legal denial, of, like a factual denial, things like that, you're talking about a trial. Like just automatically, that's going to be a trial. Nice. which means you need to gather evidence. You usually need to subpoena documents. You may need to take depositions. You have to subpoena witnesses. You, you do the lawyer stuff. You um, have to put so, in the work. Yeah, so it's not an easy process. It's not something you can just kind of navigate on your own, I think. Okay, that is good to know. Moving on to our next topic. So obviously there's a lot of information given throughout this webinar that is entitled to the California Workers' Compensation System. One question that I did have for you, however, is most of this information we're given is to the general public, general workers, for example, delivery drivers, construction workers. Are there any job sectors within the California Workers' Compensation that do have different um, challenges or different benefits that we don't know about? Yeah, so there's quite a few, actually. Um, there are teachers, um, there's some medical professionals for COVID and things like that. Um, and there's also first responders. Um, a lot of them have their own dedicated rules regarding presumptive injuries. So for example, um, police officers who've been wearing a gun belt for more than five years are entitled to a presumptive low back injury, which means when they file a case alleging that their back was injured as a result of their employment, um, it's presumed that it happened at work. Mm -hmm. um, same thing for types of uh, cancers, as well as heart troubles, things like cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, uh, hypertensive disorder, all those things can be presumed to have been caused by work if you're a police officer or a firefighter. Interesting. Are there any unique challenges for the first responders and firefighters? Yeah. You know, for first responders, it's very difficult because they have tough jobs. You know, when you're a police officer and you <laughs> chase after people and like, you know, wrangle people and do a lot of really physical intense stuff, you know, even the most minor work restrictions can be pretty significant and affect your career. And same thing for firefighters, you know, you have firefighters who are out there who are, you know, having to do pretty extreme work as well. And certain functional limitations can really hamper their ability to continue on with their work, even if they're not ready to necessarily leave yet. So when we handle fire, fire cases and police officer cases, we take a great deal in care and working with the doctors on things like work restrictions and also if they're applying for things like CalPERS disability retirement, making sure that they're going in the right direction for that as well. Um, there's also some benefits, you know, in terms of the financial benefits. Uh, police officers and firefighters are entitled to, we call it 4850 pay. That's the section of the labor code that states that for their first year off of work, instead of getting temporary disability, which is two thirds of their average weekly wage, they get their full salary. Oh, so nice. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's better, you know, it's more money in their pocket, right. basically. And then after their first year of being on salary continuation, then they transition to temporary disability for the following year. But um, yeah, there's a lot of unique challenges for firefighters and police officers, uh, first responders in general, because most of them love their job. Most of them aren't ready to leave yet. And unfortunately, injuries happen. And it's how do we navigate the system and, you know, get them the most medical care, the most benefits possible, but also get them back to work to make sure they can continue on with their career. What does this look like for them in, in, in as far as like navigating specialty or specialized benefits for them? Is it harder to get certain things or is it easier? Well, you know, the presumptions, for example, if you're in the industry and you know the presumptions, it's easy to speak to clients with confidence to say, hey, look, if you file back injury because you're caught for 15 years and you're sitting in your patrol car with your gun belt on and, you know, having to have 15 pounds on your hips and stuff, yeah. you know, it's a lot of weight. And so... It's easy to know the rules and speak with confidence to say, hey, if you file this case, it will get accepted yeah. versus not knowing, you know, in the first place. Or, you know, maybe you aren't receiving salary continuation at the right pay rate or maybe, you know, you need help navigating how to apply for a disability retirement with your, your city or your municipality, wherever it is, or, you know, CalPERS. 
there's also the component to it of like how to just navigate the system in general, you know, yeah. how to match what their goals are to what their options are and how to navigate that. Um, yeah. It's incredibly important. That's a lot, a lot of information. We delved into the overview of the legal rights you have as an injured worker here in California. What is the role of an attorney? We understand <laughs> everything that could potentially go wrong and all of your benefits you're entitled to, but where does a, an attorney come into play and why? Where are your counselor? You know, we're your confidant. We're here to essentially explain things to you, give you your options, and guide you through the process. We're not your decision maker, though. You know, as an attorney, our job is to educate you and basically help you understand where you are on the map, you know, mm -hmm. so you don't get mixed up. You know, there's some strategic decisions that lawyers make on behalf of the injured worker. You know, QME selection process, for example, is a huge one. But generally, we're here to walk you through the entire process from start to finish. And if there's areas where there's a lot of friction and we need to fight, we fight. What does a fraud and the consequences that go along with fraud look like for someone that wants to cheat the system? So it doesn't come up a lot, but, you know, fraud is out there. You know, there's people who say they were injured at work and they weren't, or there's people that, you know, um, are telling their doctor they can't work because of their work injury, but then they're caught working, you know, on camera. Outside. Yeah. So there's something called Sabrosa investigators in workers comp that literally means under the rose. It was a Latin term relating back to Cupid. And it basically has nothing to do with love anymore. But so you're it's all telling about, me Valentine's is not what no, it meant? No, 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 no. <laughs> but basically, you know, there's these investigators. There's the kinds of guy that like, hide in the bushes out front of your house and follow you around. Their sole job is to catch you doing things that you shouldn't be doing in hopes that they can somehow use that against you in your workers' comp case. And sometimes it's just insofar as like, hey, look, this person looks pretty good. Doctor, don't you think they're not as bad as you said they were? Yeah. Other times it's like this person lied, straight up said they weren't working or that they couldn't do X, Y, and Z, and they're clearly doing it to the max here. Right. Um, you know, there was one firefighter, I think he was Los Angeles County firefighter, and he got caught, I think, doing scuba diving lessons or something Ooh. like that after he had received a pretty significant workers' comp award. And so they're like, whoa, this is completely, this is fraud. This is yeah. fake. This guy's fine, you know, and like he got some big award from his work comp case. And so you can actually be prosecuted for fraud by the district attorney if they want to take up your case. Um, sometimes if you're caught, you know, engaging in fraudulent conduct, you can kind of make it go away. You know, you can settle a case. Right. Defense attorney won't report it or the insurance company won't report it for fraud prosecution and things like that. It just depends. Um, but there are pretty significant consequences, including prison time. Okay, that's that's good to know. And it doesn't just happen for the injured worker. I'm assuming the same goes for an employer that mm -hmm. is essentially doing a workers' comp fraud, trying not to, you know, have the injured worker say that the claim actually happened at work and it happened at home, there are some consequences for them as well. Yeah, I mean, every party can can get caught doing stuff they're not supposed to, and there can be significant consequences. There was a physician uh, in Southern California some time ago who was um, getting paid, I think it was like $6 million in kickbacks for referring patients to a specific hospital for spine surgeries. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he's in prison right now. Yikes. So, you know, and then same thing goes for the insurance companies. You know, they can get caught in engaging in fraudulent conduct, too, and there can be consequences for them as well. I'm glad you talked about the insurance company. That was my next one. I get it, the employers, <laughs> employees. What about the insurance company when they yep. commit fraud? So it's, it's good to know that there is legal rights and responsibilities for each one of the parties involved. When it comes to the California workers' compensation system, Let's recap the key points of this webinar, the importance of, you know, making sure you submit that DWC1 claim form, informing someone of that injury, knowing the difference between permanent disability and temporary disability, the factors that come into play from someone getting benefits for the Walker's Comp system, which essentially is medical and some sort of compensation um, while you're off of work, but the most important part is the medical treatment that comes behind it and the power of being able to jump into a different rehabilitation, vocational rehabilitation, so that you can essentially restart if you need to. There are rights. Um, I'm just 
thankful that we have Bilal that shares this information on the website for us. It's so accessible now. It's free. There's no need to pay for a consultation from a workers' compensation attorney if they are charging you run fast. <laughs> um, what's another form of, I guess, contact we can give anyone watching this webinar right now that they can dive into and kind of learn a little bit about the system itself? What are websites they can visit? Check out Pacific Workers for one. We've got a fantastic blog. Um, you can also check out our YouTube as well. We've got a lot of content. and We also have a, a separate podcast called Work Comp Talk, where we dive into a lot of issues and talk about specific circumstances and things that pop up in workers' compensation cases. You can also check out the state DWC website, DR uh, website. It's the Workers' Comp Appeals Board page. They have an information and assistance section. They also have forms and things like that on there. And if you just simply Google some stuff, you know, there's a lot of information out there and, you know, whether or not you're injured, I highly recommend you check it out. Because again, you don't want to be learning this stuff on the fly when you're in the middle of it. You know, it's easier to be ready and be educated ahead of time. That would definitely suck. And as you mentioned earlier, Bilal, we do have a podcast with it. A lot of this information, we'd love to sit here and dive directly to it. It would take hours and hours of discussions. However, we are going to be linking a lot of the conversations and podcast episodes to some of this information. And you'll find all of that in this webinar and descriptions as well. So if there is something in particular you want to learn more about, whether that's, you know, temporary disability benefits, we will be linking some of those episodes for you as well. And you can check out the YouTube channels. All of the information will be linked throughout the descriptions. We are thankful that you made it through this entire webinar. It's a little bit long, but definitely well worth the wait to learn all of this information. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more you can dive into. So thank you all for your time. And I hope we get to do this again. And I hope you guys learned something from this and we'll, we'll hope to be able to have helped someone in some way, shape or form. Thank you.